Hello and good day. So today I will I'll be starting with the lecture for integrated circuits, which is the last lecture for the cur for the course fundamentals of electronics. So th uh, this would be a three part lecture. So for today I'll be discussing the uh, concepts behind integrated circuits and some introductory uh, concepts as well. So our first objective is to make sure that we are able to compare the different IC packagings, pinouts or pin types, and orientation. Later on, with the second and third part of the lecture, we should be able to solve for the period, frequency, and duty cycle of one of the most common ICs around, the 555 timer. Now, Normally, when we had a discussion of the different circuits, you had your uh, basics of electrical circuits last semester. And today, or this semester, we have the fundamentals of electronic circuits. You learned of the different types of devices and components that can be used to create different types of circuits with the desired properties, output, and capabilities. Now, one of the good things about those devices and components because of advancements in technology we were able to shrink down those components and then combine them into a single package so we don't have to buy different components and build them on a breadboard on an IC if it's equivalent IC is available so you don't have to put it on your PCB to just have that specific design on your IC. So an integrated circuit is defined as the semiconductor wafer. So its base is still a semiconductor. And on the semiconductor wafer, we can actually include millions, hundreds, thousands of tiny resistors, capacitors, and of course transistors. And one IC could be an equivalent of dozens hundreds, and even thousands of separate electronic parts. Now, one of the best things or good things of integrated circuits is that because we are, of course, integrating multiple components, the size factor is greatly improved. So you don't need a very large square area to fit hundreds or thousands, millions of components. Instead, you just need a small amount of space for a single IC. Usually square centimeters or a few square centimeters is enough. A square inch is even enough. We could classify ICs or integrated circuits according to their main application or the type of signal they actually operate on or process. So it's actually quite simple if an IC primarily processes analog signals, for example, ICs that are used as amplifiers for radio frequency signals or anything that uses continuous wave, which is one of the main definitions of an analog signal, we could classify it as an analog IC. Now, if an IC operates on discrete defined levels, the most basic as the binary signal, 1 and 0, then we have a digital IC. So the basic digital logic gates are one of the fundamental examples of a digital IC. So is the multiplexers and flip-flops. You'll learn more about digital ICs once you get into your course about digital logic gates or logic circuits and analysis. Now, we have ICs that work or that needs or processes both analog and digital signals. So we call them as hybrid. In some text or literature, they call them as mixed ICs. One of the best examples of mixed or hybrid ICs are ICs that convert digital signals to analog signals and vice versa. We call them as DACs or digital to analog converters and 
ICs that convert analog into digital or what we call analog to digital converters. So again, we have the analog IC, the digital IC, and the mixed or hybrid ICs. Now, integrated circuits could also be classified according to how it is mounted on top of a circuit board. So if the IC is mounted directly on the surface of a circuit board or a printed circuit board or PCB and soldered on top, we call that as a surface mount. Now, if an IC, in order to be properly integrated into a PCB by drilling holes on the PCB itself and having the copper connections at the bottom or the opposite side, we call this as the true hole mounting style. The solder is usually done on the opposite side or sometimes even on the same side as well. But as long as you are, you'll be using holes on the PCB to mount an IC properly, then we call that as a true hole mounting style. So surface mount, if it's on the surface without drilling holes. Through hole, if you need to drill holes or use the holes on the PCB itself to use that IC. Another way to classify ICs is by their type of packages. So for through hole mounted style, usually we have what we call the DIP or the dual inline package. So one of the defining characteristics of a dual inline package IC is that it has two parallel rows of pins extending from the left and right side. Normally, it is black in color and mounted or encased in a black plastic housing. Usually, you will see the serial number or the type of IC on the top of the black plastic housing. For more complex ICs that uses higher integration levels and that uses surface mounting technology or SMT, they actually either use a quad flat or a ball grid array. In the quad flat packaging system, the IC housing uses all four sides as a way to put the pins into the PCB. So it can have as few as 8 pins per side for a total of around 32 or 30 pins. Or it can have as much as 70 pins per side for around 300 pins overall. And they are mounted or surface mounted on the top of the PCB. Then, for those that would be needing more pins or a different way of mounting or surface mount, we use what we call the ball grid array. It's called the ball grid array as the pins of the IC or the integrated circuit is not on the sides but on the bottom. And instead of having terminals or long slender terminals on the sides just like the DIP or the dip and the quad flat, it actually has small rounded balls of solder that you attach directly to your PCB. Sometimes you don't have to solder them directly and what they actually do is they attach and fix it using a type of um, locking mechanism. Some, the same thing that you see with microprocessors. The microprocessors have different mounting styles. One of them uses the ball grid array. They started with pins on the sides, just like a dual inline package. If I'm not mistaken, with the 4004 and the 8008, until it, invo it evolved into the ball grid array.
one of the things that you have to remember, especially when we get into the, the study or the course of digital logic gates, is determining the pinouts. Each pin in a dual inline package IC has its own specific function. We don't need to memorize those functions at that is readily available using a data sheet. But the listings in the data sheet is listed by per pin number. And we need to be able to properly identify which pin number is which. So the best way of determining the pin numbers is by looking for the notch or the dot at the top of the IC or the integrated circuit. Most of the time, if you have your dual inline package, you will see a small notch on one of the sides of the ICs. It's, it would look like a small letter C. I don't know if you can see it from the image, but uh, there should be a small notch. Sometimes, there would also be a small dot on one of the corners of the IC. That small dot signifies where the pin number 1 is. If your IC only has the small notch, that means the one di directly below it, if the notch is on the left side, would be pin number 1. Now, if we have the dot, the pin nearest to the dot would also be pin number 1. Now, the pins to the right would also would now indicate the pin or the incrementing pin numbers from pin number 1. As you can see from the image, so we have the pins 1, which is on the lower left-hand side, if the notch is on the left, then it would increase up to, up until we reach the last pin on the right. Then the next pin would now be uh, directly above the last pin. So in this case, because the last pin on the right is pin number 8, the pin opposite its end directly on top would be pin number 9 and it would increment in a reverse way so instead of incrementing from left to right it would now increment from right to left so as you can see from the image the 1 to 8 goes from left to right but the pins 9 to 16 goes from right to left now by looking at those pins and at the data sheet you'll be able to tell which pins they are and what functions the pins do. We could also classify ICs according to the integration level it has. When we talk about integration levels is how densely packed the components are inside the IC. When the transistor was, was created so we call that as the zero-scale integration because it only contains a single transistor. So technically speaking, it's not yet an IC. So the first major type of integration done on an IC is SSI or the small-scale integration. So these types of ICs contain around 2 to 30 transistors per IC or per package. So it is used for digital logic gates and some early linear ICs. It was quite important in the development of aerospace technology and aerospace projects. As using this type of small-scale integration actually led to smaller electronic circuitries. The next step in the integration process would be the medium, the medium scale integration containing around 30 to 1,000 transistors, or 10 to the 3 or 10 to the 3rd transistors. So early calculators use this type of integration. Now, in the 1970s, which is the advent of the creation of the microprocessor, that is when they were able to advance the technology enough that they were able to fit around 1,000 to 100,000 transistors in a single package. So this is what we call the large-scale integration, usually using MOSFET or metal oxide silicon 
field effect transistor. You'll know more about MOSFET when we get when you get into the course about digital logic circuits and analysis. So this is usually used to create computer memories or early computer memories and second generation and even first generation microprocessors. Then from the 1980s up to the early 2000s, they were able to fit around 100,000 to around 100 million transistors into a single package. With this development, computers became more powerful and even cheaper to produce, which now meant that computers could now be owned or could it is viably possible for residential or the public to own computers. Unlike before, computers are mainly used for education or research purposes, for business, government, and military applications. Up until the early 2000s, the latest was VLSI. But because of the increasing number or integration levels, they actually added two additional integration levels, namely ULSI, which is around 100 million to 100 billion transistors. And the number of transistors actually dictate how powerful a microprocessor is. So this would now be including, if I'm not mistaken, our multi-core transistors and the uh, multi-threaded transistors as well. Newer microprocessors would now have what we call the GSI or the gigascale integration containing 100 billion to 100 trillion transistors in a single package. And this made more har uh, powerful hardware in terms of computational power. Now the emerging technology for integration levels would be the terascale integration in which they are creating a CPU that could contain up to 100 cores without sacrificing the size of the microprocessor. So that would give us around teraflops of speed, flops being the number of instructions executed per second, and that would lead to much more powerful computers. So that would be around 100 trillion to 100 quadrillion transistors. So that ends the first part of my lecture for integrated circuits. Next week, I'll be discussing the multivibrator circuits or one of the most and the one of the most common ICs around, which is the 555 timer. The third part of the lecture will focus on some of the computations that is required, especially in the design of the circuit of a 555 timer. As always, please stay safe. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, don't hesitate to comment or directly give me a message. Thank you very much and good day.